Greetings, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I know we're still in our time of uh, quarantine or being shut down, whatever you want to call it, just being at home with Jesus. That sounds good to me. Um, but I hope everyone's doing well. And a message I have for you today is um, the Lord said that he's calling us to come up high into him and to know him as Abba Father. It's time for us to begin to make our ascent into the mountain of his glory and into his holiness. So, you know, um, Psalms 24 speaks about that, and we're going to read that a little bit later. But <clears throat> the Lord was talking to me about us coming up the mountain of God and um, ascending the mountain of God. He said it's his desire for all mankind to know him as Abba Father. And 1 Timothy 2.4 says that he wants all mankind to know, you know, come to the knowledge of his son, Jesus, and to be saved. So um, we're beginning our journey. When we're born again, we begin our journey of holiness in him. And, and I kind of look at it this way. You know, when we get born again, our road is very wide. Our path is wide. And each time that we choose Jesus and, you know, we have tests and trials along the way and we could go back to the way things were, but we choose him and we're obedient. We keep walking. That road or path becomes more and more narrow. And pretty soon, because you're making the right choices and following him, pretty soon it's just you are walking in his sandals. You're putting all of your cares and your burdens on him. And he's really carrying you through this because you're trusting him. So, and we are all the time ascending the hill or the mountain of God. Now, the Lord um, said to me that some, however, get stuck and they never proceed past the breaking of the bread like the 70 elders. Now, I want to stop there and read... Um, Exodus 24. Okay. I'm not going to read all of it, but um, Exodus 24, verse 1. God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, and the 70 of Israel's elders, and worship at a distance. He said, Moses alone shall come near the Lord, and the others shall not come near and neither shall the people come up with them. So Moses um, explained this to all the people, and they all agreed, which says with one voice. They said that all that God has said for them to do, they would do. And he built 12 pillars. Um, he read the Book of the Covenant. He made sacrifices. He sprinkled them with the blood. And then verse 9, it says, Moses... Aaron, Nadab, and Behu, and the 70 of the elders went up into the mountainside. And they saw the God of Israel. Now, this is amplified. It says, that is a convincing manifestation of his presence. And under his feet, it was like pavement of bright sapphire stone, like the very heavens in clarity. And upon the nobles of the Israelites, he did not he laid not his hand to conceal himself from them, to rebuke their daring or to harm them. But they saw the manifestation of the presence of God and ate and drank. Now, to me, you know, I think that's like having communion with the Father. And the Lord said to Moses, this is verse 9, Come up to me into the mountain and be there, and I will give you tables of stone with the law and the commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses rose up with Joshua, his attendant, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, so this is uh, Aaron, his sons, and the 70, he said, tarry here for us until we come back to you. Remember, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a cause, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. And remember, Joshua had to stand at the base of the mountain there. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, God called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. 
And the glory of the Lord appeared to the Israelites like devouring fire on top of the mountain. Moses entered into the midst of the cloud and went up the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, you know, the children of Israel got impatient because he didn't come back down. So I'm going to go back here. The Lord is saying, um, okay, all of us are called to come up that mountain. When we're born again, we begin our journey of holiness in him. So we begin that ascent when we're born again. But he said, some, however, get stuck and never proceed past the breaking of the bread like the 70 elders. Um, see, I, I believe that they never had the fear and awe of God like Moses did. It was just kind of like, well, here we are. You know, we've been selected and... And so it was, and they just didn't have the fear and awe. And he said, some go back to the golden calf. They want to return back to the pleasures of life, their old nature. Um, some stand at the foot of the mountain, like Joshua. Now, I know Joshua replaced Moses when Moses, you know, was not able to go into the promised land, but... I feel that there are people who stand um, at the base of the mountain, so to speak. They want somebody else to do the work for them. They'll just pick up little tidbits along the way. You know, I think of myself when I was in the Baptist church. I thought, well, you know what? That preacher went to church. He went to uh, college. He went to ministry school. And he learned what he's supposed to learn to teach me. So I just kind of went and made a grocery list most of the time. I listened, but I didn't really learn anything. So if we're going to press into God, we need to be doing something. Now, Joshua did. Joshua was forbidden to go any farther. And he said, some dare um, to climb deep into the promises of God. So that's like Moses. He was called to come up higher. So he asked me now, he said, where is the body <clears throat> today? And I said, I believe that there are different places on that mountain, but they still, some still haven't made their ascent. And he said, correct. However, some prefer to continue worshiping the golden calf. Now, remember when Moses is gone for those 40 days, the children of Israel got discontent. And Aaron, remember Moses said to Aaron, Aaron and her are, here with you. So if you have a problem, ask them. He should have directed the children. He was next in command. He should have directed the children in the way they should go. But you know, whatever, I can't answer for him. Fear overtook him. You know, maybe the mob of the people did. And he literally led them in a revolt. He said, bring me the gold. And they, they melted it down and he built the calf. He was very wrong. So some of them, they continue to worship the golden calf. And he asked me why. And I said, I don't know, maybe security. I'm not sure. He said, yes, they fear the loss of what they have and what they see. Their need to tangibly feel and embrace things is greater than trusting the God that they cannot see, touch, or feel. So he said, he's going to begin to change that. He said, I'm going to show begin to shine light on their golden calf. This is us. He's talking about us. And allow them to smell its stench. And it will begin to rot right in front of their eyes. And he's talking about the idols of our heart. Anything that we put ahead of him, he's going to remove it. You know, he can either fall on the rock or the rock's going to fall on us. And I feel there's a grace right now. If you know, I, I guess I always say, ask God to search your heart and, and whatever he shows you, if you need to get rid of it, do so. Okay. Um, then he said, then they, they shall behold him. He said, will they do this? Will they behold him? And I said, I don't know, Lord. And he said, some will, yet some will continue to seek yet other God. It's like they're willing to give up one thing. But in doing so, they still want the way of the world, so they'll embrace something else. They want to keep um, part of the world in their life. 
And, you know, God won't violate man's will. Now, he gave me reasons why they can't embrace him and why they prefer the golden calf, the ways of their life. First thing he said was stubborn, stubbornness of man's heart. It prevents them from becoming spiritual. They are stiff-necked and prideful. Now, in Exodus 32, 9 and 10, this is where uh, Moses, he's been up on the mountain 40 days and nights, and he's received all of the information he needs about the tabernacle and all the things that are placed inside and the priesthood. And now uh, he receives the tablets, and now God says to him, he wants him to go back down. He said, these people I gave you, to, that you brought out of Egypt, they built a molten calf. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me, God is saying that, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make you a great nation. He would make Moses a great nation, but Moses pleaded with him. You know, he interceded because he knew these were God's people and he knew that they were the ones that would make him a great nation. So he had to go down, Moses had to go down and deal with them. Now, the second thing he said, um, why they prefer to embrace the calf instead of him, he said there's too much intellectual thinking and reasoning out of unbelief. He said if they can't see it or touch it, it doesn't exist, and therefore many will lose out on salvation's call because they're trying to reason this out, how a God they can't see could come live within them. So they'll they'll lose, or I should I don't want to say lose their salvation. They'll never receive it because they're trying to think it through instead of just by faith receiving it. Um, the third thing, he said, lack of faith and unbelief. Now, Matthew 17, 20, this is right after the transfiguration, you know, and Moses and Elijah are there, and Jesus is transfigured, and he's glowing, and he and um, Peter, James, and John, they come down the mountain, and here are his disciples, uh, and they ministered to a young boy who had epilepsy, and the father's going to Jesus, he said, what's wrong with your disciples? I know these are your disciples, but what's wrong with them? They're trying to cast a demon out, and they can't. And what is wrong? And Jesus said, this is Matthew 17, 20, he said, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, saying to the disciples, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Now, if you would read on to verse 21, okay? Jesus is talking about their unbelief because he said this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. He's not talking about this kind of demon. A demon is a demon. There's not different kinds of demons. It's a demon. He's saying this kind of unbelief. They had unbelief. They needed to fast and pray to them to be delivered of their unbelief. Then they would have the faith to cast out any demon. And Mark uh, eleven twenty three says, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things that he says will be done. And whatever he says, you know, he will have. Um, see, we need to not speak to God about our mountain. We need to speak to our mountain about God. You know, what is our mountain? What is it that we need to put aside? It's already a done deal. We just need to be able to get rid of it. And the last thing that he said was um, a sanctified imagination, that we need to take all of our thoughts captive. And, you know, 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, you know, we need to, um, bring every thought into captivity and to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Anything that comes before him, you know, we need to set that aside, cast it down, and 
and then um, believe him. And I, I like the story in Mark 5:36. you know, Jarius, he's the commander, and he, he's coming to the Lord asking him, my daughter is dying. And he needed Jesus to deliver her. And in the meantime, when Jesus is on his way there, the lady with the issue of blood comes to him and, of course, touches him, and, you know, she's healed. And he said, your faith has healed you. Well, as he's kind of going through the crowd, as this has happened, people are coming to Jairus and saying, don't bother the master. Your daughter's already dead. But see, here's what Jesus did. Jesus ignored that. He, he didn't pay any attention to it. And that's what we need to do. We need to take our thoughts captive. Can we do that? Paul says that we can take our every thought captive. And, you know, when this is our battlefield here, you've heard that many times, but it really is when we, our thoughts come to us, it's either our own imagination, it's God speaking to us, or it's the enemy. If, if the Lord is speaking to it, he may bring us correction, but it's not mean. He brings a correction because he loves us. But he will bring his love, his joy, his encouragement. It will always be uplifting. Even if he corrects us, it's because he loves us, but there's a grace in that. His mercies are new each day. So it's going to be encouraging. The devil will always bring us something condemning us making us think that we're crazy you know we don't understand you can't do this you can't do that you can't believe you can't whatever it's never encouraging and you know it's yourself when it's always about me i i i me 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 you know you're the one so um we need to take our thoughts captive if you are entertaining the wrong thought stop it Turn from that. Say, no, I'm not going to, you know, I, I can be reading something. I can be reading the word and there'll be a strange thought come into my mind. I'm like, where did that come from? It's not from God. You know, it's the enemy trying to uh, bring something of my past back that I've been forgiven of. And I don't need that. And I'm like, no, I'm not, you know, doing that. And in, like in your dreams, if you're dreaming, you're having awesome spiritual dreams. And then something demonic comes after, after right after the good dream or dreams. I asked Bob about that because I'd have like three or four awesome dreams and then I'd have something nasty come at me. And he said it's because the enemy, he doesn't know your dreams, just like he doesn't know your thoughts, but he knows, even though he doesn't know your dreams, he can see that light when God is giving you something spiritual, a spiritual dream. He can see that. He can see the light. And that's why he will attack that light. He'll throw something demonic uh, at you right after that. Um, okay. Now, the Lord said that there is still hope. He said, I never turn my back on anyone who calls upon my name. See, he, he wants to deliver us from the things that are restraining us from going up the fullness the height of that mountain that he's called us to, we can all go there. We all ascend at a different pace. It's how much are you willing to sacrifice? How much are you willing to give up of the things that are um, idols in your heart? It can be a small thing. It can be food. It can be, uh, well, right now we don't have a whole heck of a lot that we can do, but you know, it can be television. It can be the internet. Uh, but it can be anything. I know at one point the Lord told me an idol in my heart were my grandchildren. I spent a lot of time with them, and I really had a great time. <laughs> I really did. Well, uh, he ended up sending me on two different trips, driving trips, where I was gone three weeks at a time. So I was gone three weeks, home like three weeks, and then gone again for three weeks, and then another three weeks. Well, that put a... a <laughs> a little dent in, in my time with my grandkids. And you know what? We They didn't suffer uh, separation anxiety. We did uh, 
oh, little Zoom calls or FaceTime, whatever. So, you know, we had a little bit of time that we saw each other and that was good. But, um, you know, they became an idol in my heart. I was doing more with them and for them. And I just love them so much. But, you know, he had to separate us. And now, of course, this, well, hey, here we are. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. So, um, okay, he said, his mercy is endless. And he said, I am merciful to those who are heirs of salvation. So, all right. Now, I want to read um, part of Psalms 24. Because here's the question. Who may ascend into the hill or the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol or sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him. Who seek your face okay now um, I believe that many times over the years uh, and, and perhaps more so with new Christians they've looked at the Lord as being like a Santa Claus if he's just going to give them good gifts and he does give us good good gifts but you know they're to give to others and we would come to him seeking his hand. We're wanting a handout. Give me this, do this, you know. If I if I follow you and you love me, then you'll give me everything I want. Well, that's not the way it works. But um, we are the generation that's coming to him to seek his face. And we seek it. The more we seek it, the more we're going to find it. And the closer we climb up that mountain of his glory and of his holiness, we're going to get closer to him and see it. Um, conform to his likeness. Hear his voice. Obey it. Walk in the divine nature of Jesus Christ, doing all things in love. Um, be holy as he is holy. I'm not saying have a religious spirit, you know, like you can never cut your hair or wear makeup or they've got some quirky things that, you know, was really a religious spirit. Repent quickly. You know, repentance is really on the Father's heart. And as we do things, to know what to do and not do it is sin. So we need to do what the Father's calling us to do. And what he's calling you to do may be different than what he's calling me to do. You know, sometimes he's, he's called me, you know, like get in the car and start driving. I'll tell you where to go. Well, he may not tell you to do that. You know, uh, when he started telling me that, uh, my family thought I was nuts. So cast down your vain imaginations. Draw near to him. He hasn't moved. You know, it's us. He has not moved. He's on the top of the mountain waiting for us. He has not moved. And... You know, I, back in 2001, the Lord took me up the mountain of God. And he said, for 10 days, in fact, I didn't know at that time how many days it would be, but I, I only had water and a, a tea, not sweet tea, but it, there's a special tea. <clears throat> and I was in my room. Um, my son and I shared an apartment. So my bedroom, I had the master bedroom, so I had a bathroom there. And he would bring me ice. He'd put it outside my, my room. But um, he said I had to cover my windows, put all my pictures away, so I didn't see anybody, anything. He said, I'll, I'll be the only face you see, the only voice you hear. And I covered my mirrors. I didn't see myself for 10 days. I probably had a bad hair day every day, but, you know, that was fine. The things I learned in that time, just being alone with him, um, there's no, it's priceless. You, you couldn't put a price on that, but it is very true. I only heard his voice. I didn't see outside. I didn't hear a radio. There was no TV. There was nothing but the Lord. And so who can ascend 
the hill of the Lord. Those with clean hands and a pure heart. You know, it's the those who are pure in heart are those who see God. That's why he wants us to have a pure heart. So let's all ascend. He's calling us to ascend so we can come closer to him. I, I don't want to be... I want to be like Joshua that would follow Moses and he replaced Moses when, when Moses was taken. But the thing is, he was forbidden to go any farther. God called Moses up that mountain. But now we have that opportunity that we can continue to go higher, to go higher in him. And um, there's no there's no end to where he wants to take us. You know, he's an eternal God, and we're made in his image, so we can go as high as he will take us if we will get rid of the idols in our heart. So I bless you this day. I just pray that um, that in this time you continue to seek the Lord and seek his face, seek his glory, sleep, seek his presence. And some of you may not have as much time as others, but whatever time you have, you know, there's no time or space in the Lord. So, you know, use whatever time you have. Make it, make it worthwhile, okay? Be blessed, and I'll talk to you next week. Amen.